Welcome back. So this is part one of a two-part, <clears throat> excuse me, integumentary system. Um, function and assessment, part one. And then the follow-up will be part two, which is nursing care and pathophysiology of different types of integumentary disorders. So this chapter, um, we're going to talk about what's the function of the skin, what are the structures of the skin, what happens to the integumentary system with aging, um, what kind of data collection do we need to utilize when we're assessing somebody with a skin disorder, what tests do we use, labs, diagnostics, etc., and then what therapeutic measures can we use to help treat patients with these disorders. So the first couple of slides are kind of um, a review of anatomy and physiology. So if you think back all the way, way back when, to when you first learned A&P and body structure and function, you'll remember that the skin has layers. The epidermis is the top layer, and that really doesn't have any blood vessels. It gets oxygen from the layer beneath it, which is the dermis. And the dermis is the, the deeper layer that has um, the blood vessels in it, the hair follicles, collagen, which we all need, keeps um, the skin elastic and able to stretch, uh, reticular fibers, um, which works with the collagen to let it stretch. There are um, sweat glands, sebaceous glands, which are oil glands, nerve endings, hair follicles, um, all those things in that intricate thing that we call the integumentary system, which by the way, when it comes to our immune response, what is our number one line of defense? Our skin, right? That's it. So it's like a coating that we have over us to protect us. And then the third, but last but not least, is underneath the, the skin is a layer of subcutaneous tissue, and that's called the hypodermis. Basically what that is is kind of it's fatty tissue, adipose tissue, connective tissue, that kind of attach the skin to the tissue. It's mostly fat. So when we talk about, say, for example, administering a subcutaneous injection, well, that's where we're going, into that subcutaneous fatty tissue. Um, and it serves a purpose. It helps to insulate the body, helps regulate our temperature. So very important. When we move on to the next slide, number four, hair. We have hair. Um, when it comes to hair, it really does serve a purpose. So hair is for warmth. It's for protection. Hair also is meant to kind of catch on to pathogens like microscopic pieces of dust and so on and so forth uh, and protect it from getting to the skin. And then the glands in the skin. We have apocrine, eccrine, and sebaceous. Sebaceous glands are the oil glands. They basically, it's, it's not really oil, but it's an oily substance and it's called sebum. And that's what keeps our skin moist and supple. Uh, it also, believe it or not, has some antibacterial um, uh, effects. So when I talk about, for example, people using hand sanitizer or overusing it, we have the nature's most perfect immune system and protective mechanisms. When we use hand sanitizer over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, basically what we're doing is disabling our own immune response. So we're disabling the skin on the hands in addition to disabling the sebum and its antibacterial properties, okay? And then the eccrine glands and the apocrine glands. I'm not gonna get into, you know, a lot of specifics about this, but basically your eccrine glands sweat, right? Sweat is a way of um, insensible fluid loss helps us get rid of waste products, toxins, et cetera. Um, and, you know, we need sweat to, like I said, get rid of toxins and get rid of some extra fluid. And then you have the apocrine glands. Apocrine glands basically have a duct that's connected to the hair follicles. And they're mostly in two areas, your axillae and the anogenital, the groin region. And believe it or not, they have very specific scent glands that respond to specific things. So when people talk about, you know, the human being has their own natural odor, that's what they mean. All right, enough of that. Moving right along, aging. So with everything else, aging we know has an effect on every body system. Integumentary is not an exception. 
hair follicles start to become inactive, right? And so over time, the melanocytes and melanin is that substance that gives our skin color and our hair color. Well, as they start to die, your hair starts to get gray. No, that's sad. We have division of cells. That's how we get new skin. Old skin sloughs off and new cells grow to produce new skin. Well, that slows down. And the fibroblasts that are inside the dermis, all that becomes slower. And so the skin starts to become thin, a little more fragile, and the healing process gets slowed down. So if there's any kind of a compromise in skin integrity, a cut, you know, laceration, anything, it takes a little bit longer to heal. The longer that a wound takes to heal, the higher the risk for infection because you've got an open area for a longer period of time. And then, you know, fat decreases, skin starts to get, to get dry because of the decrease in the sebaceous glands, so you don't have a, uh, much sebum anymore. And it gets harder to regulate temperature because those sebaceous glands and those sweat glands start to get slower and inactive. Ever notice older people are typically a little cold all the time? So that explains why. All right, when we're assessing our patient, do they have a history of skin disorders? Are there any risk factors that we need to know about? Genetics, personal habits maybe, you know, that, that could compromise their skin. We're looking at their hair and their nails. We're looking at any medications. Remember, over-the-counters, herbals, everything. Anything they're exposed to. So always occupational history. What do you do for a living? What did you used to do for a living? And then that acronym that the book loves, What's Up for Assessment. When you're looking at your patient, the minute you walk into the room, you look at them, you can start assessing before you even touch them or say a word. What is the color of their skin? Does it look normal and typical for their ethnicity? Are there any noticeable lesions? What's the skin look like? Is it moist? Is it dry? Do you see any noticeable edema anywhere? Are there any lesions, vascular lesions? So in other words, things like stasis ulcers, which we will get into in the next uh, part two of integumentary. What is the skin integrity? Does it look intact? And is it clean? What is, what is the level of cleanliness? Because that's important too. The next slide goes into every single medical term for different types of lesions. So when we talk about a lesion, a lesion is, could be a scar, could be a mole, could be a freckle, could be a stasis ulcer, a pressure ulcer. Anything that's on the skin is a lesion. And lesions are divided into primary and secondary. When we talk about primary lesions, there are many different kinds, macules, papules, nodules, vesicles, bola, pustules, wheels, so cysts. Make sure that you look over this, and I'm, I'm going to give you a kind of a quick overview. Bola is a blister. That is the easiest way to describe a bola. It's a blister right? So it's kind of a fluid filled sack. And years ago, believe it or not, a nursing intervention, if the patient did develop a blister, we would pop the blister. Don't do that. The blister's there for a reason. It actually helps to protect the compromise underneath of that fluid and helps it heal. We have macules. Macules are kind of flat you can't palpate them, right? But they are changes in the skin color. So where most of the skin looks one color, you may see something, a little area that's a different color. Usually smaller than one centimeter, usually harmless, you know, kind of like uh, a freckle. A papule is raised. So a papule, instead of being flat like a macule, it's raised, you can feel it. So when you run your hand along the skin, it's raised. We can be talking, when we say papule, we can be talking about a wart, a mole, right? So that's that. A nodule is a solid elevated lesion. A nodule feels kind of like a ball, maybe a tennis, not a tennis ball, a golf ball or something under the skin. An example would be when you palpate cervical lymph nodes, they're, they, they're nodules and they feel like little peas under the skin, okay? A vesicle. A vesicle is like a little blister. It's raised and it has serous fluid. It's got that clear fluid in it. Um, one of the most common vesicles that you'll see, chicken pox, varicella, shingles, also poison ivy. That's very, very typical response of the skin. Then you have a pustule, just like it sounds, pustule. 
A pustule is like an abscess. It is filled with pus, purulent exudate, okay? Elevated, and it's you can notice that sometimes they, they are deeper than they appear, and they have to be lanced, and we'll talk about that more in the next part two. A wheel, you've heard me say this before, hives. A wheel, and it's not like W-H-E-E-L, W-H-E-A-L, hives. They're raised, and they're usually round, and they are very typical with allergic responses. When we talk about plaque, you think about the heartbreak of psoriasis or eczema. It's dry, scaly, snake-like skin, right? Plaque um, that when, when it's very itchy, it's because it's so dry, and when it's scratched, it actually can flake off. And then last but not least, we have a cyst. And a cyst is a lesion that is actually um, we could call it a tumor, but they're typically not cancerous. They are typically benign. But it is a lesion that is not supposed to be in a certain place. Uh, can be palpable, can be non-palpable. Some common areas, ovarian cysts, usually benign. Um, pilonatal cysts. They are cysts that can occur because of a blocked hair follicle right at the coccyx. Very common for people that tend to be a little hairier. So those are your primary lesions. The secondary lesions, we're talking about things like um, ulcers. When we say ulcer, ulcer or ulceration is an erosion of something, a wearing away. So ulcers can be pressure ulcers. They can be venous stasis ulcers. They can be diabetic ulcers, right? It's wearing away of the tissue, okay? We have a fissure. A fissure is like a crack in the skin, usually very deep. They're not superficial, and they go through the epidermis, dermis, and into the, the hypodermis. It's painful. We have uh, excoriation. Excoriation is kind of like a traumatic abrasion. When I think of excoriation, I think of a road rash, if you guys know what that is. Anybody that's ever, say, fallen off of a bike, scraped their knee, that's scraping against that concrete. That's excoriation. Uh, I'm not going to get into leukinification, but a scar, you guys know what a scar is. So if there's been a compromise in the skin integrity, and depending on your ethnicity, your age, and you know the, the type of skin that you have, scarring can be uh, anything from very mild to moderate to very noticeable, like a keloid. Okay? So make sure you understand the terminology. It's important. <clears throat> we're not going to go into configuration, but again, when we're assessing, we're looking at the hair. What's the distribution? What's the color? What's the quantity? Is it thick? What's the texture? Do they have hair loss? The nails tell you a story. What color are they? What shape are they? Are they clubbed? COPD. What's their texture? Thickness. Do they look like they have a fungus among us? Any abnormalities? Okay. So that's at a glance. And then what kind of diagnostic tests? Well, we can do cultures of wounds. We can biopsy skin integrity compromised areas. And we can do wood light examination. We're not going to get into. Nobody's going to ask you about that. And skin testing. So in other words, uh, for different types of allergies and those types of things. Um, what we're going to be more concentrating on when we get to the next chapter or the part two of this, which is chapter 54, is lesions and dressings. So kind of an overview of those. When we talk about therapeutic measures for compromised skin integrity, we have dressings, open wet dressings, wet to dry dressings, specialty dressings, medi honey, calcium alginate, silver, hydrocolloid, which is duoderm, if anybody's heard of those, and topical medications. So this was kind of like an overview to help you to better understand the skin. You know, what gives the skin its color? Melanin. Uh, melanocytes give the hair its color. And all the things that we talked about. So you have a basic understanding of the function and the assessment of the integumentary system. So stick around. And the next video is going to get into a lot of detail about what's the difference between a pressure ulcer and a stasis ulcer and how can I tell and all those good things. So stay tuned for more. See ya.